Perlman is the award-winning author behind modern classics Three Dollars, The Reasons I Won't Be Coming and the novel Seven Types of Ambiguity. He's been published in 20 countries and is considered one of Australia's finest authors. His latest novel is called The Street Sweeper and it's Random House Australia's Book of the Month for October. Welcome, Elliot. Thank you, Veronica. Firstly, congratulations on an incredibly well-crafted story. It was beautiful and horrifying and breathtaking and page-turning and so epic. I mean, how would you describe it to someone who'd never read it without well, using the same words as I did because that's cheating? Thank you, um, firstly, for that um, kindness. Um, I guess I would start by telling people um, a little bit, but not very much, about the plot and saying that it concerns, it begins with the story is told through two characters, two men in early 21st century New York. And these two men will have stories that are interwoven and will ultimately meet up. But at the beginning of the novel, they don't know each other. Who are these two men? One of them is a man named Lamont Williams. He's an African-American ex-con, a probationary janitor in a hospital a man who can't locate his little daughter and hasn't seen her since he was imprisoned. And he gets this chance. If he can survive six months on probation in this hospital, he has the chance to restart his life and with any luck for him, find his daughter. Now this man at the hospital strikes up an incredibly unlikely friendship with a patient an elderly man, a Jewish Holocaust survivor. And this friendship is going to provide each of those two men with comfort and it's going to propel the story. Now, Elliot, the reference notes and acknowledgements in The Street Sweeper are nearly as long as the book itself, I found. It was a whole nother read after you'd finished. Um, was it true it took six years in the making? Almost, probably, you know, five and a half to six years. Not quite six, but yeah, it, it did take a the long book, time. The book, not the reference notes. The book, no, yeah. the reference notes took significantly less time, <laughs> which was a relief. Um, so tell me about the process of writing the book in six years. Where were you? Well, look, a lot of the time, especially initially, was spent on the research. And I probably did, in fact, I definitely did more research for this book than for my previous books, all three of them put together. Mm. and. It wasn't just a matter of chasing down resources, uh, you know, books and articles and reading them, which it was and that took long enough, but I also travelled to the various places. I mean, I went all over New York City and to Chicago and to Krakow in Poland and Warsaw and uh, six times I felt I needed to go to Auschwitz. Six times? Mm. Wow. Well, why six times? <sighs> Yeah, um, it's such a difficult uh, place to write about, I think, with any, um, frankly, it's daunting. And the sense of um, responsibility mm. that you have is so overwhelming that I think I had to, um, There's, there's no way you can become comfortable with it, but I had to go there and be there enough times to feel, I don't know, almost that I had the right to try to write about that. So can you tell us about your experience interviewing the last Polish Jewish survivor of the Zonderkommando? Right, the Zonderkommando were those prisoners mainly, almost entirely Jews, but not all of them were, who were forced on threat of immediate death mm. to work in the gas chambers and crematoria. And I got to meet this man who was in his 80s, who had the most incredible stories. And I think the last time I was in Poland was in March or April of 2008, and he died just a few months later. Um, did you record the conversation? I did, I did. Mm. And I think, you know, without that meeting, I wouldn't have the book, or it certainly wouldn't be the book that it is. So I was incredibly lucky to meet this man. And you're shaken by what you hear. You know, it's, it's frightening. Um, 
But it's he making seemed, me feel awful just <laughs> hearing about it. Well, you know, you've just got to be grateful that the man was willing to tell his yeah, story and he was a little old man and we, his wife wasn't well and we had to go uh, to a hotel in a tiny little village, the freezing day, and the three of us, Robert and the man uh, whose name was Henrik Mandelbaum, mm. um, we, I interviewed him and Robert did the translation and it was terribly moving. I was very lucky to meet him. Elliot, in your latest novel, The Street Sweeper, uh, one of the things that you write about is the controversy surrounding the presence or absence of black troops at the liberation of Dachau. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I actually came uh, across this pretty much the way the character Adam does in the novel, which is first to learn that there were black troops, black veterans of World War II who uh, said that they were present at and even instrumental in the liberation of the concentration camp Dachau, which was uh, the first concentration camp that Hitler set up in Germany well before the war just to put political prisoners and all sorts of people he didn't like, which was a lot of people. Um, and there was a PBS, a public television documentary that was made in the early 90s that was dealing with this, the role of black troops in the liberation of Dachau. Mm. And then there was this incredible uproar um, suggesting that there were no black troops at the liberation of Dachau. And as you can imagine, this is incredibly offensive to black veterans if they were there. But of course, um, there are people on the other side, and you know, sadly there is an other side, to say that they weren't there. And um, as Adam does in the novel, I contacted the US military historian to try and find out, well, you know, you think, how do, how do you get to the bottom of this? And um, of course, just because an official record says one thing or the other doesn't mean it's right. Uh, but it was really fascinating to me that the US military historian would neither confirm nor deny that there were black troops present at the liberation of Dachau. But nonetheless, the producers of the PBS documentary, the public television documentary, were so spooked by this that they pulled the documentary. So it, it leads to the question, if it's not true, why did the black veterans say it was true? And if it was true, why are there so many white people trying to say it's not true and to delegitimize black troops? Did you find the answers? I, I didn't find, I, I don't know, I can't definitively say whether they were there or not. I wish I could. Um, but if I'm going to be scrupulously, um, to, to think like a historian, I don't have enough evidence to say definitively whether they were there or not. And it's uncomfortable for me to say that because if they were there, it's terribly offensive to say they weren't there. But I can't say they were there for sure because I just don't know. Elliot Perlman, this is a question that we ask all of our authors. What is the book that has most influenced your life and why? Wow, um, it's got to be one book. Oh, that's terrible. Um, I hate having it limited to one book. <laughs> <clears throat> Hadn't you thought about this beforehand? You knew this was coming. <laughs> well, you know, it's like death. You know it's coming, but you don't really prepare for it. You don't want to think about it. No. Too hard. No. Um, can I make it one author? Yeah. Because then you can get to go home if it's, you make it one author. It's not quite along the guidelines that we're using here at mm -hmm. Random House Australia Book Tour, but go for it. Well, I don't even like limiting it to one author, but I'm going to because you really want me to. Mm. Um, I probably have to say Thomas Hardy mm. um, because he could do everything. He, uh, he could write short stories that no one ever talks about, but they were brilliant. He was an incredible poet and he wrote the most beautiful, moving novels that dealt with people 
that other novelists weren't writing about, people that were considered too insignificant. And he had such empathy and compassion and understanding into the plight of women and the poor and the marginalised. And he did it with such psychological authenticity, if you like, mm. for a 19th century rural man who never went to university. It's just stunning that he was able to pull this off. And um, yeah, if I had to nominate one writer, I'd say Thomas Hardy. But I don't like nominating only one writer. <laughs> Sorry that I've had to make you do that. Well, okay. If you do want to download the first chapter of The Street Sweeper, you can do so at randomhouse.com.au. Next month, we're going to be talking to Frank Morehouse about his new novel, Cold Light.